mysterious serial killer whose identity has long remained a mystery. A DNA from a shawl recovered at the scene of one of his crimes has incredibly found a 100% match. The case of Jack the Ripper is officially closed. This is not a rumor. It is a scientific certainty backed by a 100% DNA match. For 137 years, the world has been obsessed with a phantom in the fog. We blamed princes, painters, and even Americans, but the answer was never lost. It was hiding in a cardboard box, stained with blood, waiting for technology to catch up. We finally have the name and the biological proof, but here is the catch. The police knew who he was the entire time, and they let him walk away. The shawl that knew too much. This whole story comes down to a single dirty piece of cloth. For over a century, the legend of Jack the Ripper was built on shadows and fog. Everyone had a theory. Some said he was a royal prince protecting a secret. Others said he was a brilliant surgeon gone mad. But here's the catch. All those theories were just guesses. The real answer was sitting in an auction house disguised as a piece of Victorian trash. In 2007, an author named Russell Edwards bought a silk shawl. It was huge, measuring about seven feet long. It was dyed with expensive indigo patterns, which was odd because the women of Whitechapel were incredibly poor. The seller claimed it was found next to the body of Catherine Eddowes, the Ripper's fourth victim, back in September of 1888. The story was that a policeman at the scene took it home for his wife. Yeah, about that. His wife hated it because it was stained with blood, so she threw it in a box. It stayed there, unwashed, for generations. Most experts laughed at Edwards. They said the shawl was fake. They said it was just another piece of ripperbilia that floods the market. But Edwards had a hunch. He took the fabric to Dr. Jari Luhelin, a specialist in genetic analysis at Liverpool John Moores University. This wasn't like testing fresh DNA from a modern crime scene. This fabric was 126 years old. It had been touched by hundreds of people. It was fragile. So, here is the deal. The scientists used a special vacuum technique to pull microscopic cells out of the fabric without destroying it. They were looking for two things. First, they needed to prove the shawl was actually at the crime scene. They found traces of kidney cells in the bloodstains. And get this, the victim, Catherine Eddowes, had her kidney removed by the predator. That was the first massive wow moment. They extracted mitochondrial DNA. This is the key. Unlike regular DNA that gets mixed up every generation, mitochondrial DNA is passed down directly from mothers to their children. It acts like a biological time capsule that never changes. The team tracked down a living relative of Catherine Eddowes, a woman named Karen Miller. They compared her DNA to the blood on the shawl. It was a perfect match. This proved for the first time in history that we had physical evidence from a Ripper crime scene. But that was just the beginning. Under UV light, they found something else. Stains that looked like seminal fluid. This was the smoking gun. If they could get a DNA profile from that fluid, they would have the genetic signature of the monster. And that is exactly what they did. But before we reveal the match, we have to look at who everyone thought it was. The suspects that got away. Before science stepped in, the world went crazy with theories. And that is putting it lightly. Because the police never caught him, people filled in the blanks with their own nightmares. The most famous one? The Royal Conspiracy. This theory is so popular it became a Hollywood movie. It claims that the killer was actually Prince Albert Victor, the grandson of Queen Victoria. The story goes that the prince secretly married a Catholic shop girl and had a child. To protect the monarchy from scandal, the royal physician, Sir William Gull, was sent out to silence the women who knew about the baby. People love this theory because it involves carriages, secret societies like the Freemasons, and a cover-up at the highest level. It explains why the police were so ineffective because they were ordered to be. But here is the catch. Records show Prince Albert Victor wasn't even in London during the slayings. He was in Scotland. Then you have the American Devil Theory. Some people are convinced that Jack the Ripper and H.H. H. Holmes are the same person. Holmes was the American serial slayer who built a murder castle in Chicago. The timeline sort of fits. Holmes was active in the 1890s and there are gaps in his history where he could have traveled to London. The crazy part is that H.H. H. Holmes actually looked a bit like the eyewitness descriptions of the Ripper. They both had dark mustaches and sharp features. 
People claim Holmes went to London to sell skeletons to medical schools. But again, there is zero hard proof. It is just a spooky coincidence that connects two of history's worst monsters. And get this, there is the painter theory. Walter Sickert was a famous artist who lived in London at the time. He was obsessed with the Ripper case. He painted scenes that looked suspiciously like the bedrooms of the victims. Some people think he put clues in his paintings, literally drawing the crime scenes from memory. They think he was taunting the police through art. He even titled one of his paintings the Camden Town Murder. But was he the killer or just a guy with a dark obsession? Then there is the Diary from Hell. In the 1990s, a scrapbook appeared that was allegedly written by a cotton merchant named James Maybrick. In the diary, he confesses to the crimes, saying he was doing it because his wife was unfaithful. He signed it Jack the Ripper. It caused a massive media storm. Experts analyzed the ink and the paper. While the paper was old, the ink was suspicious. Most people now think it was a modern hoax, but for a few years, it looked like the case was solved. Everyone is obsessed with these wild stories because they are exciting. We want the villain to be a prince or a genius. We don't want him to be boring. But the DNA does not care about excitement. It only cares about biology. The DNA pointed to someone nobody wanted to believe. The Barber of Whitechapel. The DNA from the shawl did not point to a prince. It did not point to an American. It pointed to a man named Aaron Kosminski. The results from the semen stains were compared to a living descendant of Kosminski's sister. It was a 100% match. Basically, science just confirmed what the top police chief suspected 100 years ago. But who was Aaron Kosminski? The reality is way grittier than the movies. He was a 23-year-old Polish immigrant. He came to London in the early 1880s, fleeing brutal violence in Russia. He settled in Whitechapel, the heart of the slums. And get this, he worked as a hairdresser. That means his daily life involved handling sharp razors and blades. He knew how to cut. But Kosminski was not well. His family knew it and the police knew it. He suffered from severe paranoid schizophrenia. He heard voices. He refused to wash or bathe, terrified that people were trying to consume him. He had a violent, deep-rooted hatred of women. He lived with his brother and sister right in the middle of the slaying zone. If you look at a map of where the bodies were found, Kosminski's house is practically in the center. He was walking the same streets drinking in the same pubs, and watching the same women. The crazy part is that the police actually caught him. Sort of. In the years following the crimes, top police officials wrote private memos naming Kosminski as the prime suspect. Chief Constable Melville McNaughton wrote in 1894 that Kosminski had a great hatred of women and strong homicidal tendencies. But here is the catch. In Victorian England, you could not just test someone's DNA. You needed a witness. The police actually brought a witness to a seaside home to identify Kosminski. The witness said, yes, that is him. But then the witness refused to testify in court. He said he would not have the blood of a fellow neighbor on his conscience. Without a testimony, the police could not hang him. So what did they do? They watched him, they followed him 24 seven. And then the attack stopped. Why? Because in 1891, Aaron Kosminski was dragged away screaming to Colney Hatch Lunatic Asylum. He never walked free again. He perished in the asylum years later, taking his secrets to the grave. Until now, the DNA has finally spoken for him. But how did he get away with it for so long? Policing the nightmare. To understand how a 23-year-old hairdresser outsmarted the entire British Empire, you have to look at the stage where this horror played out. Whitechapel in 1888 was a nightmare. It was not the clean, paved city you see today. It was a maze of filth. Over 900,000 people were crammed into a few square miles. The poverty was crushing. Women like Catherine Eddowes and Mary Jane Kelly were not glamorous. They were desperate. They were selling intimate acts for the price of a loaf of stale bread or a glass of gin. They had no home. They slept in dues houses where you paid pennies to sleep on a rope strung across a room. The environment was the killer's best friend. London was famous for its pea supers. These were thick yellow fogs caused by coal smoke mixing with a river mist. The fog was so thick you literally could not see your own feet. 
A man could attack a woman on a street corner and a person 10 feet away would see nothing. And everyone is obsessed with the idea of a master criminal, but the police were fighting with one hand tied behind their back. They had no radios, no cars, no forensic science, no fingerprinting. If you touched a crime scene, nobody knew it destroyed evidence because evidence was not even a concept yet. On the night Catherine Eddowes was found, the night the shawl was dropped, the city was in chaos. It was the double event. The Ripper had already ended the life of Elizabeth Stride less than an hour earlier, but was interrupted. He was angry. He was hunting. He found Eddowes in Mitre Square. What most people do not realize is that he almost got caught that night. He left a piece of Eddowes' apron near a doorway in Goulston Street. Above it, there was graffiti written in chalk on the wall. The Jews are the men that will not be blamed for nothing. This is huge. Kosminski was Jewish. Was he writing a message or was he trying to frame his own people to cause confusion? The police commissioner was terrified that the message would start a riot against the Jewish community. So he ordered his men to wash the writing off the wall before a photographer could get there. They literally scrubbed away the only written clue the killer ever left. This mistake let the trail go cold for a century, doubting the data. So how solid is this science? Because when you make a claim this big, people are going to attack it. And that is exactly what happened. When the findings were released, other scientists jumped in to critique the methods. They argued about touch DNA. This is the idea that because the shawl was 100 years old, many people had handled it. Maybe the DNA came from a person who packed the shawl in the box. Maybe it came from the descendant who gave the sample. The critics also pointed out that mitochondrial DNA is not as unique as a fingerprint. It is shared by thousands of people who have the same maternal ancestry. They said the match could be a coincidence. They claimed the mutation found, known as T1C, is common in Europeans. But here is the deal. The scientists fired back. They calculated the probability. The odds of finding both the victim's DNA and the suspect's DNA on the same piece of cloth in the exact spots where the bodily fluids were found are astronomical. We are talking about millions to one. Also, look at the provenance. This shawl was not found at a garage sale. It was kept by the family of Acting Sergeant Amos Simpson, who was there that night. The family story is that he asked his superiors if he could take it because he wanted to give it to his wife as a dressmaker's material. It sounds horrifying to us today, but back then, police did not have strict protocols. They took souvenirs. The fact that the shawl has indigo dye, which was expensive, is another clue. Catherine Eddowes was poor, but she was known to pawn things. Or maybe the shawl belonged to the killer. Maybe Kosminski brought it with him. That is a wild theory, but it is possible. What matters is the intersection of data. You have the police suspicion from 1888, you have the geographical profile placing Kosminski at the center of the map. You have the timeline of him entering the asylum right when the crime stopped. And now you have the biological link. It is like a puzzle. One piece might be a coincidence. Two pieces might be luck. But when you have four or five pieces locking together, it is a picture. If the police were so sure it was Kosminski back in 1891, did they purposefully hide the truth to prevent an anti-Semitic riot, or was it just incompetence? Tell me what you think in the comments below, and if you want more solved mysteries, make sure to like and subscribe.